All right, so in um, Titus chapter 3, I want to focus in on verse number 8. Titus 3 verse number 8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. What we preach about tonight is maintaining good works. And I was reading through the Bible and this phrase just kind of stuck out to me because, um, you know, this is the Apostle Paul writing to Titus and he's, he's giving him some instruction and he's saying that um, this is a faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. These things that I'm telling you, look, you need to be affirming these things constantly. It needs to be brought up over and over and over again. This is a faithful saying that you do these things, that you maintain good works. It says that they which have believed in God, so the believers, the, you know, the, the, the members of our church here, those that believe in God might be careful to maintain good works. Maintaining good works is very important as in your Christian life. You don't want to start slacking and laying off the good works. It'll, it'll be a, a severe detriment to your life in general. We need to make sure, and it's something that needs to be hit upon over and over and over again. Paul's saying, look, I will, it's my will. I want you to do this. I want you to affirm constantly that you do these things. Just, just reaffirm it, reaffirm it over and over again. Look, we need to understand, we need to be very careful to maintain good works. Why do we have to be careful about that? We'll get that in a minute in James 2, but James 2 says, faith without works is dead. So those of us that have faith, those of us that have believed on God, we want to make sure that we still have a living faith, a faith that is alive, a faith that is not dead. Now, we're not worried about losing our salvation. That is not the reason why we're worried about having a living faith. But you know, the Bible is very clear that once you're saved, you have eternal life, everlasting life. I'm not going to go into that this sermon. But the Bible also says that faith without works is dead. We need to make sure that we're careful to maintain those good works. We want to be a healthy Christian. We want to be spiritually healthy. And part of doing that is going to be doing good works. Obviously, we need nourishment. We need to be, we need, you know, think about a body you need to eat. For your body to be nourished, for your body to be healthy, you need to eat nutritious food. And not only that, you need, you need to do some form of exercise to stay healthy. And it's the same thing spiritually. We get our nourishment and our spiritual meat from God's Word. This is the manna. This is what we need to eat. We need to be reading this daily. We need to be ingesting God's Word and taking this into our bodies to be spiritually healthy. Not only that, we need to be maintaining our good works and acting on and doing these things that we learn about and that we read about in the Bible that God has for us in order to stay, to stay healthy. Um, and if you look down in Titus 3, verse 14, he says, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. When you start giving up the good works and you're not doing as much good stuff, you're going to become unfruitful. And as we mentioned in previous sermons, you know, God's looking for us to be his servants. Amen, you're saved. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that you have a home in heaven, in heaven that's been secured and bought and paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. But that's not where your life stops as a Christian. That's where it starts. That's when you're born again. Yeah, you know you have that inheritance, but that's a new life that's just starting for you. The life that you have that's just begun is, should be one of good works. It should be one of obeying and doing what's right in God's eyes. And it should be one where you can be fruitful, where you can actually produce something. You can actually do something for God. Instead of just going through your life and just... just having God done something for you and that's it and you're okay with that and you just go out the rest of your life and say, well, I'm going to heaven. That's it. As opposed to actually being a fruitful servant. servant. And we've seen before that, you know, with the, with the parable of the fig tree, when, you know, they're, they're ready to, to, to get rid of it. It's not being fruitful. It's not doing anything. And if we get to a point where we're just not doing good anything for God, we're not doing good, we're not maintaining good works, our faith dies, God might, might physically cause us to die and just say, well, what are you doing here anymore? I have no use for you. You, you know, the, Everything I had planned out for you to do, you haven't done anything. And um, he, can, he can cut our life short. 
We want to make sure that we're maintaining good works. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. We're going to see why it's so important to maintain good works and to be doers of the word. Um, there's a lot of reasons for it. We're going to go into a lot of scripture that talk about this. But turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. It's not too far from where you're at, just after the book of Hebrews, the book of James. James 1, look down at verse 22. The Bible says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we just got done reading in Titus 3 that we need to maintain good works. And one of the ways you're going to do that is, is when you come to church or when you, when you read the Bible for yourself, when you hear the word, that you're not just a hearer. When, when you hear things preached, when you read them for yourself, that you don't just read over them and just say, oh, okay, yeah, that's what the Bible says and just keep going. And you can believe it. Right? I mean, you're a believer of the word, but when you don't put it into practice, you're just going to forget about it. You're going to read over it. You're going to read it. And then even later on, you, you might hear a preacher and, be, and just totally forgot that you'd even read that before. Anything you don't put into use, any knowledge that you gain, anything that you learn, if you don't put it into use, you're going to forget about it. I mean, think about all the stuff that you've learned you know, in grammar school and in high school and you're forced to memorize all these different things and dates and, and all this other stuff. Well, if you're not using it, if you're not going back to it, if you're not referencing it in your regular life, I mean, who can say you honestly remember like all of the dates and, and, and events and everything that you had to learn in say American history, all the different battles, all that, you know, and you say, well, this was fought here. And you know, some people have really good memories for that stuff. But in general, you know, okay, you could say, oh, I'm really good at that. Well, what about all the formulas you had to learn in chemistry and in physics and in math and, you know, and all this different, whatever you might have taken. If you're not using it daily, you're going to forget about it. And that's just part of who we are as human beings. And this is what he's saying in the Bible. It's the same thing. If, if we hear God's, God's truth and we learn something from it, Unless you're putting that into action in your life and you're making changes and you're, or you're doing something, you, you know, you could hear all day long that it's, you know, we need to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. That's something we need to do. And you can say, you know what, I believe that. But when you don't put it into action and you don't do anything on it, well, the week's going to start going by, you're not even going to think about giving anyone the gospel. It's not even going to be a thought to you. But the more you start doing it, the more you go out and, and you know, you start and you go maybe once a month or, or once every other week or something like that, it's going to be in your mind more. It's going to be fresh and, and you're going to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And now you're going to start thinking about it more and more often and, and to the point to where now, like, I mean, I'm always thinking about opportunities to give people the gospel. It's like, I mean, it's all the time. If I, if I wasn't doing it, though, I would forget about how important it is. And, 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 you know, no matter how many times it's proven to you from the Bible, you can believe it. But unless you're doing it, you don't even think about it. You could just go on with your daily life and you have all these opportunities to give someone the gospel. You're not even thinking about it because you never do it. And that's something that we need. To, and that's one example. I mean, every single truth of the Bible is like that. If you don't, you know, whether it be a sin that you need to change in your life, if you don't make that change, if you don't make steps to change in those things, you know, um, I don't know if this is a silly example or not, but, but I have a, I have a, a problem with trying to manage my time because I'm really busy trying with my family and work and with the church and stuff. And, and one of the problems I had recently was just getting sucked into stupid games that just eat up way more time than I, than I ever want them to. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say it was some huge problem, but knowing what the Bible says about redeeming the time for the days are short, it, you know, like all, all the, the, the responsibilities that I have and trying to meet all that stuff, I don't have time to be messing around. So one of the things that I had to do was, you know, just eliminate the games from devices altogether and just say, you know, it's not even going to be available for me to do it. And that was some small, just to give you a little insight in my life, that's something that I had to deal with. And I'll probably have to deal with again because 
I'm a nerd and I like stupid games and, and you know, it's just a waste of time is all it is. And I needed to get that out of my life. And that's one of the ways that I did it. But I have to act on it. If you don't act on it, you're just going to continue doing the same pattern. And just like anything, we need to be a doer. And you're going to forget about these things. You forget about the scripture that, that refers to that stuff. So we need to enact this stuff as we hear it. We need to be careful to maintain good works. And, um, and it says that if we're, if we're not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, it says, this man shall be blessed in his deed. God's going to bless you for that, for, for actually going out and doing the things that you learn, and, and it'll stay with you. Um, being a doer of the work will help you to grow into a spiritual adult. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Hebrews 5, we're going to be going to James 2 next. Hebrews 5.13 says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You want to grow as a Christian, the only way you're going to grow is by reason of use. When you hear God's word and you put it into action, you put it into use, you start using it, God's going to open up your understanding and give you more knowledge and give you more wisdom. If God's giving you wisdom already out of the Bible and you're not doing anything with it, why, is, why would you think he's going to give you any more? He's going to say, well, you're still a baby. You still just need to learn these basics and these fundamentals and get them down and actually start using them in your life. But when you actually start to use them, you know, you th the perfect example is a baby. You're not going to teach a baby how to, how to jump rope until they learn how to crawl and then how to, how to cruise around and then how to actually walk and then how to jump. And, you know, there's all these steps that have to be learned in between. They're not going to just start learning how to jump rope just right off the bat. You know, they have to learn all of these different things. And it's the same way spiritually. We need to learn the fundamentals. We have to learn the basics. And as we learn that, God's going to open up and reveal more to you. But you have to be practicing. I mean, a baby that just lays in the crib all day and doesn't even try to move around, they're never going to learn how to crawl. You could, you could try to teach them all day long. You could try to tell them things all day long. But if they're not actually going to do something about it, they're not going to learn anymore. And that's the way, you know, think about yourself as that spiritual baby if you're never putting anything into practice that you learn from the Bible. We need to, to incorporate God's Word into our lives, whether it be, like I said, whether it be sin or whether it be doing things that are, that are good, that are beneficial, that are positive, that are, you know, visiting the, the, the poor and the needy and, and going out and doing good for others. There's, it's a twofold thing. There. It's not just sin. It's also going out and doing good work. Um, you're in James chapter 2, right? Look at verse number 14. Here we're going to see where the Bible talks about faith without works is dead. And this is, a, this is so twisted, typically by the Mormons and some others that want to prove a works-based salvation. I'm not going to get too much into that tonight, but um, it's, it's a false doctrine. This is talking about being justified before men and, and how does it profit people when you just say you have faith and you don't act on it. Because it, it doesn't. It doesn't do good for anybody. It doesn't do any good for anyone else for you to say, well, yeah, I believe that, that we should um, you know, do unto others as I would have them do to myself, and just, but then never do it. Never, never treat people that way. Never, never treat people, um, esteem others better than yourselves, and, and, and never treat people that way. Well, it's one thing to believe it, but that doesn't do anyone any good just to believe it if you're not actually doing something about it and acting on it, which is why in verse 14 of James 2, he says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? There's no profit to the person who just says he has faith and doesn't do anything good. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Again, he's saying, anybody can say these things, but it doesn't do any good unless you act on them. Someone comes to you and like, I need clothing and I'm hungry. I don't have any food. And you're like, I, you know, I wish you blessings and food and clothing. And <laughs> there you go. See ya. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do them any good. Unless you're actually saying, you know what? Yeah, you, you need food. You need clothing. Here you go. I'm going to take an action and, and help you out with that. It does that person no good whatsoever. 
even if you believe, hey, you know what? The right thing for me to do is going to be to help you out and give you that stuff. See ya. Does no good. This is what James 2 is all about, really. I mean, it's, it's, it's about doing these things um, because it's beneficial to others, because it's profitable to others. So in verse 17, that's why it says, even so, even so what? Even so, and with what we just read here, to telling people to depart and be at peace, you know, if you don't help them out, it doesn't do them any good. He says, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Is it possible for a Christian's faith to die? Absolutely. The Bible says right here, it's defined by not doing works. Christian, you have faith in Christ. If you're not doing any good works, guess what? Your faith is going to die. There was a time in my life, I got saved when I was 20 years old. I was doing zero works. I was not going to church. I was not reading my Bible. I wasn't even praying to God. I wasn't helping people out. My faith was dead. Does that mean that my soul was going to go to hell and I no longer had everlasting life? Of course not. That's stupidity. I already received the free gift. It was given to me not based on any of my works. So not doing the works isn't going to remove that free gift from me. It's never based on works. It has nothing to do with works. But my faith that I did have when I put my faith on Jesus Christ had died when I just wasn't doing any works. And that faith was dead for a while. But you know what? That faith revived once I started doing works again for God that were pleasing to God and that what He wanted me to do. That faith revived. But no matter what, it doesn't mean I've lost my salvation and regained it somehow. No, Jesus only had to die one time to pay for my sins. And the moment I received Him as my Savior, that was the day that I was saved eternally, forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, um, let's keep reading here, though. Because faith without works, it is dead. And that is a true statement, which is why we need to be careful to maintain good works. We don't want our faith to die. It's just going to lead to more and more problems in our lives if we don't have faith in God. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Um, and it, br it brings up these examples of Abraham and Rahab and the things that they did, how they acted upon their faith. They acted upon the fact that they already believed in God. Now, spiritually, that gave them their own salvation, just the fact that they believed God. But their faith was made perfect. It was made complete through their works. It was, you know, it, it, it brought them to a place of completion where they say, you know what? Not only do I, do I believe this, but I'm going to act on it and prove that I believe this, that it truly is a belief. And again, this can get, you know, when your faith is dead, it can cause you to start to doubt your salvation, which is the same exact thoughts that I would have because I would think to myself, I knew what I believed. I knew I believed in Christ. But when you're not acting out and where you're going against what the Bible says, it only makes you think and wonder, do I really believe this? How can I say I believe this? Because you're being a hypocrite. How can I say I believe this when I'm doing the opposite, when I'm doing against what the Bible says? And you start to struggle with that more and more because your faith is dead. It doesn't mean that, again, it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. It just means that you're going to go through a lot more struggles and trials and it's going to be a lot harder to trust God just in general in your life. We need to have that faith in God not just for our salvation, but just in general in our life when we go through hard times, when we go through trials and tribulations and persecutions, that faith is going to get us through those hard times. It's going to help us to get through those times righteously as opposed to falling into sin and backsliding and getting out of the fight. We need that faith as, as our shield to, to, to help us to stand in the days of persecution when, the, and when those trials come. We definitely want to make sure that our faith is not dead at those times. If, our, if we're relying on a shield to help us when, when we're getting attacked, and all of a sudden that shield's gone because our faith is dead, that's a problem. We need to make sure we maintain those good works so we can keep our defense up. 
Um, the good works are important. It has nothing to do with you being saved eternally, but, but they are very important. They're critical in our lives. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 5. Um, actually, no, no, turn to, um, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I'll just read Matthew 5 for you. Um, while you're going to Ephesians 2, Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus is commanding us, telling us, look, you've got a light. You've got the light of, of God inside of you. And no man lights a candle to put it underneath something. And the candles are lit so that you can see, so it can illuminate the room. We don't, we don't get light bulbs and put them in a box somewhere and just never plug them in and turn the switch on. You know, the whole reason we have them is to light up the area we're in. You have a light in your heart. If you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit, look, God wants that light to shine. Don't keep it in. Don't keep it to yourself. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God. You should be doing works that can be seen by others. It's not in order to be seen by others. It's not the reason why you do is just to receive the praise of men. But the good works that you do should still be evident by others. When you go out knocking on doors and, and getting people saved, it's not just to be seen of other people, say, oh, wow, look at that guy. He's, you know, he's really a godly person because he's knocking on doors. That's not the purpose of doing it. But people should be able to see what you're doing and say, hey, praise God, there's someone out winning souls. And uh, that's what this is teaching here, that we have that light. Hey, let it shine through your good works, that other people can see your good works and glorify God. Praise God, there's someone doing good works for God. Um, Ephesians 2, look at verse number 8. Very famous uh, portion of scripture here. We use this out sowing all the time. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. So very clearly telling us, look, your salvation, your soul being saved has nothing to do with your works. It's not of our works. But, keep reading here, it says, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are created, we're born again in order to do good works. That is our purpose. After you're saved, hey, we need to do good works. It says, the verse, that, uh, verse says, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has created us in order to do these good works. God has saved our soul. He's given us a new creature. He's given us this new man so that we can be Christ's servants and that we can actually go out and do these good works. Amen. We don't want to be useless to God. We need to make sure we're maintaining good works. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, you have to turn there. Turn if you would to... Um, well, go, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy 2. We're going to be in, in 1 Timothy quite a bit. Give you a minute to get there. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 9. The Bible reads, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. This is this is now um, you know, a section of scripture that's designed for women and how they ought to um, behave and act. It says that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. The good works aren't only for the men. Obviously here, it's saying a godly woman. It gives these other attributes saying, you know, to be dressed modestly. Basically, it's, it's, it's this whole, that whole verse 9 is trying to teach women that you, don't, you shouldn't be dressing and acting and everything else in a way that's drawing all the attention on yourself. Modest means it's not flashy. You're not wearing all this gold and all this jewelry and, jewelry and glitter and everything else that would draw people's eyes to you to be looking on you. God's saying, you know, it, and women have a tendency to do that, to, to want to wear the flashy stuff, to want to look that nice. And what it does is it draws all the attention on you. And God's saying, look, a godly woman is not going to do that, is not going to dress that way. 
and it says the way that they but the way that they are going to adorn themselves is with good works. So when people see you, they shouldn't just be seeing this flashy outward appearance. You should be able to, they should be able to look at you and be able to see your true value which is on the inside based on your good works. It says, which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Um, that is what is truly important anyways. People shouldn't just look at you and think, um, you know, flash you, whatever, whatever, whatever image is presented through the outward clothing and appearance and things like that. It should be something to where it's not noticeable at all. It's not something to even draw one's attention to what you're wearing. It's really just a matter of, hey, here's a woman and she's doing good works for God. Praise the Lord. That's the way that we ought to look. And men the same way, but this is, this is specifically in, in 1 Timothy 2 directed for women to, to not care. I mean, don't worry so much about the makeup and all these other things because you're worried about what people are going to look and see when they see you. What you should be worried about, if you're worried about what people see when they see you, it shouldn't be based on, on how flashy your clothes are and, and how much jewelry you have. It should be on, am I living righteously? Am I doing right? Because that's what I want people to see. It's those good works. Turn, if you would, over to chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to see here about widows. Now, again, good works is important for everybody. Men, women, children, you know, elderly, everybody. Maintaining good works is important from the day you get saved until the day you go to be with the Lord. Every single day of our lives, good works are important. And we're going to see here, good works are important if you ever become a widow. Verse number 9 says, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old. Having been, and this, these are the requirements now for a church, taking care of a widow. It says, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. So someone who already has done good works in their life, not someone who all of a sudden their husband died, now I'm going to do good works. No, they're already well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet. Remember we were talking about that last Wednesday about Jesus Christ washing the, the disciples' feet, taking on that humble job. If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So you might be saying, you know, this is real general, Pastor Burson. You're talking about maintaining good works. Yeah, I know. We should be doing good works. Yeah, we should be good, doing good works. Well, and we get a good list of things that are all good works here uh, for a woman to do in 1 Timothy chapter 5. What well, report out for good works? What do you mean by that? Well, she brought up children. She's lodged strangers. People are coming to town. They need a place to stay. They don't have anywhere to go. Being very hospital, bringing them into your house, washing the saints' feet, taking care of the, the, the saints who are going out and doing a good work and literally just, just taking care of them, you know, physically, whether it be their feet or whatever. If she have relieved the afflicted, people who are having problems, you're going through and helping them. Someone gets sick in the church and, and the lady goes out and she cooks for them and cleans for them and helps out and does all these nice things. If she have diligently followed every good work. These are all good things. These are all good works. This is something you want to be known as someone. You don't want to be known as the lady who wears all this flashy jewelry and, you know, whatever and gets and gets looks at because of the things that you wear. You want to be known as the woman who says, that is someone that I can rely on. That is someone who, if I ever have a need, she's going to be the first one there. She does good works. She helps people out. She, you know, her, she raises her children to be godly children, whatever. All these different things are all very good works that you should be focused on way more than, oh man, my husband doesn't make enough money for me to have another diamond necklace or whatever things that are the outward adorning that mean nothing. We need to focus on maintaining those good works. Uh, turn over to chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is an, an admonition to people who are rich. You know, the, the, Jesus said that it's, that it's harder for a rich man to get saved than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But, um, but he also said that all things are possible with God. Now we know from the Bible that there were men who were wealthy that were saved. 
You think of Job. Job was a very wealthy man and he was saved. He, was, he had all kinds of great wealth. You think of Abraham. Abraham ended up being a pretty wealthy man. He had a lot of flocks and herds and you know his stuff and lots of stuff. Like the land couldn't contain them. They had to split their separate ways just because they had been blessed so much. They had so many things. And um, Joseph, who took the body of Jesus and put it into a tomb, the Bible also records that he was a rich man. You know, he, had, he had a lot of money. So just because someone's rich, obviously it's going to be difficult for that. But it's going to be very difficult for that person to get saved because they tend to have pride and they have need of nothing and they see no need for God in their life. But not everyone that's rich isn't saved. There, there are people who are rich that, that, um, that are saved. And verse 17 of, of 1 Timothy 6 gives us a, a message for those people. The Bible says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Again, right away, starting off, don't get proud. Because that's the easiest thing for you to do is to get high-minded and lifted up thinking, I'm such a great person because I have all of this stuff. I've accumulated all of this wealth. And you just forget about God and forget that, you know what? No, God actually just blessed you and, and you have all, the, all of this stuff as a blessing, maybe a special blessing. It's not all because of you and you don't get high-minded and forget about God. Um, he says, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So he's saying, you know, the things that he's telling them to do is to basically forget about the riches that you have and be rich in good works. That is what's important. It's way more important than the money that you have, that the riches that you have. If you're going to be focusing on anything, make sure you're rich in good works. Make sure that the amount of works that you do make you wealthy just if you were to count up the number of good works you do. Instead of counting up the number of dollars that you have, count up, hey, I've helped this many people out. I've won this many souls. I've gone out. I've given this much time to God and done all these different things. You want to be rich in those good works. Flip over to, um, to Titus chapter number 2. And this is from our memory verse, Titus chapter 2. We'll be learning this next week. <sighs> Titus chapter 2 and verse number 7. This was a charge to Titus for him to show his good works. Um, again, Titus was a pastor, and, and the Apostle Paul was, was giving him some advice here in his epistle to Titus. Titus 2.7 says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Again, here's some more good works that you should be able to incorporate in your life. Now, yeah, Titus was a pastor, so I definitely need to take all of these things to heart. But it's not just for the pastor. It's for yourself also as a Christian. A pattern of good works. You need to be able to show yourself as a pattern. Someone else can look at you and say, you know what, that's a pattern of good works. He's got good doctrine that's not corrupted because he knows the Bible. He's put in the work and the effort to study and to read for himself. And the things that he's saying, they're not corrupted. They're, no, they're not false doctrines that he's teaching. He's well learned and knows the Bible well enough to be able to tr preach doctrine and not have it be incorrect. He's gravity. Gravity means you, know, you treat the Bible seriously. You give it the proper weight that it ought to have. Sincerity, you, you know, you're, you're speaking in truth out of the heart, not just, um, you're not just faking it. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. So you're careful with the things that you say, that you're not just flying off at the mouth, you're temperate, and, and people don't have any reason to accuse you of anything that you've done that would be wrong or wicked because you have sound speech, you have sound doctrine, you, you're, you're well studied, you're well versed, you're, you, you take things seriously. These are all good works that we should show ourselves a pattern of. It says that he is of the contrary part may have no evil thing to say of you, that they'll be ashamed. So that your enemies that hate God, the enemies that hate the fact that, you, that you're actually going out and serving God, they're not going to have anything to say against you. Or even like Daniel's enemies. If you remember Daniel, he, um, he was lifted up into a high position of power in the kingdom. And 
you know, people that were close to his equal in, in rank and in administration and the, you know, the jobs that they held, they hated him. They didn't like, they didn't like Daniel. They wanted to get him fired. They wanted to get him demoted. They, they saw Daniel as a threat to them. And, but they had nothing to bring against him. So they had, to, they had to concoct a law to make that would go against him serving God because that's the only way that he was going to break the law, the only way they were going to find any fault in him at all because he lived such a righteous life, because he was doing things that was right and, and, and he was walking the straight and narrow and, and you know, he was right in the eyes of God and in the, guys, in the eyes of man. He lived a righteous life. He was, he was very careful to maintain his good works and to do things the right way. They had nothing evil to say against him. The only time they were able to say anything against him is when they made a law that, that contradicted God's law. And of course, Daniel did the right thing and chose to serve God rather than men. Um, turn, if you would, to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. We're almost done. I'm going to read from you from Hebrews chapter 10. You know, one of the reasons we come to church... Is to, is to edify others and to help us all to maintain our good works. We need exhortation sometimes. It's hard. You, you, know, you, you struggle with all of your daily struggles with, with going to, to your work or, or dealing with, with other stress and other issues in your life. Sometimes it can be difficult to maintain the good works that we need to in church. Sometimes it's, it's, it starts to get easy to get distracted with other things. We need to get around God's people and need to get in church and need to be around other believers that can help us get excited about the things of God again and again and again because it could get dull. You could fall into a habit to where it starts to get dull and then it's easier to brush that stuff aside. We need to make sure that we are we are getting excited about serving God, that it's fresh in our minds, that it, the importance is, is, is always a reminder, and that we're, we're provoking one another to do good works. That's what it says in Hebrews 10, 24. It says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We should be provoking each other to do good, to do good works to God. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As the day of Christ is approaching, as, as these times get more difficult, it's so much more important that we are provoking one another, that we're encouraging one another, saying, keep up the good work. Hey, keep up the soul winning. You're doing a great job. Hey, I'm going to go out soul winning. Hey, I just saw this person saved the other day. Getting people excited about serving God. That's going to get you to want to, to go out and do the same thing. We need that. We need that in the church. And that's why it's so important not to miss services and to be here as often as you can. So much the more as you see the day approaching. It's going to get harder and harder out there to serve God. And we need to be able to, to boost each other and to help each other with that. And then I'll read from you from 1 Peter 2.12. says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So other people, bring glory, it brings glory unto God when you're doing your good works. Other people can see that that's going to bring glory and honor unto God. Again, you're not doing it for yourself to bring glory and honor to you. You're doing these good works to serve God and to bring honor unto His name. You're in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to see what happens to a church that stops maintaining their good works. A church that, that has gone spiritually dead because their faith doesn't have good works anymore. And this happens all the time. I've visited churches where it seems like nobody's doing anything. They believe, they believe right. They believe, they believe the gospel, right? They're believers, but nobody is doing any good works. They have not been careful to maintain good works. Revelation 2, look at verse number 1. We're going to see what happens, what God's writing to. Now, in Revelation 2, just real quickly, Revelation 2 and 3, we have these epistles, these letters that are written unto these seven churches, they are real churches that existed in this time period that this was written. Now, 
Just because it was written to them, it's still all applicable to our churches today. These are struggles. These are all common things that people go through and that churches struggle with. There's some things that are good and some things that are not good. And they can all, we can all look at this and learn from this, even though this was written specifically in Revelation 2.1 to Ephesus. This is the church at Ephesus. But let's look at this real quick because we're going to see what happens to a church that stops working? Verse number one of chapter two says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He's saying that, you know, he, there's a lot of imagery here. I'm not going to get into it too much, but the seven golden candlesticks are basically seven churches of God. And he's saying, you know, if you don't go back to those first works, those works that are important, those works that you need to do, if you don't go back to those works, I'm going to remove your place. I'm going to remove that candlestick. You will cease to be a church that I recognize as a church of God. That's a big deal. I mean, you ought to be able to hear this in fear and think, man, I don't want that to happen to our church. We need to be careful that we maintain the first. What I believe it's talking about here with the first works, I believe this is talking about the soul winning. I believe this is going out and actually doing the real first works. I mean, the first works of our church is definitely soul winning. We need to win souls to get a congregation of believers to even form a church. We need to have people who are saved to come in here and, and to congregate with us and to even establish this church at all and to have this church exist as a legitimate church. It needs to be made up of, of believers who are baptized and um, the only way we can do that is by doing this work and doing these first works. Those are the most important works that we need to do. Because he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. So they have the right beliefs. I mean, they can't bear those who are evil. They don't like to see evil things. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and has not fainted. So they're doing some kind of work, but they're not doing the important works, the first works. Now, God gives them a serious warning and tells them to repent. He says, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove that candlestick out of his place. What's interesting here is in every single letter to these churches, there is one commonality among all of them. God is judging and looking at the works of every single church. This is what he's looking at them for and what he's judging them by is their works. Look real quick. We'll, we'll, we'll go through these real fast. Look at verse number 9 of chapter 2. This is to the church of Smyrna. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. Look at verse 13. This is under the church at Pergamos. The very first words, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. The, the church of Thyatira, look at verse 19. What does he say? I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Look at Sardis in chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation 3, 1 says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that at the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And then the church of Philadelphia, verse 8 I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And then finally, the church of Laodicea, verse number 15, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold nor hot. And he goes on saying he's going to spew them out of his mouth because they're not cold or hot. Every single one of them, he starts off saying, I know your works. I know your works. This is what I like about what you're doing, and this is what I don't like about what you're doing. But every single one of these churches is judged by their works. If, we're, if we want our church to thrive and to survive and to make it through and for God to bless our church and to use us and to do all these great things, our works better be right. 
We don't want to have a dead church. We don't want God to look down and say, look, you're not cold or hot. I want to spew you out of my mouth because I know your works and you're basically not doing anything. Works have no part of our salvation. You better be dead sure it's a part of our Christian life though. We need to make sure we're careful to maintain our good works. Um, turn if you would one more place. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. See, if we're careful to maintain our good works, God's going to be judging our church based on our works, but we're going to receive a reward for our works. It should be good enough that God commanded us to do good works and we should just do them because God said so. That's a good enough reason to do it. Just to obey God because He said that we ought to do it. But you know what? God is really loving and God, and God really gives us so much and blesses us so much and He loves us so much that not only is He saying, that, hey, I want you to do this and you need to do this because I'm telling you to do it. He says, you know what else? If you listen to me, you do my work, you do the good works, I'm going to reward you for it. I'm going to give you blessings that you're going to earn rewards for yourself up in heaven that you will have forever. It's everlasting. If you are careful to maintain the good works that we're supposed to be doing here, not only did I tell you to do them, but I'm going to bless you for it. I'm going to give you rewards for that. You are going to earn great rewards based on the things that we do. Matthew 6, 16, 27, you have to turn it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. We're going to get a reward for that, and that's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. Um, you're in 1 Corinthians 3. I'll read from you real quick from 2 Corinthians 5. These are both talking about that judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor, we work, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. When we stand before Christ, we stand before that judgment seat, God's going to judge the works that we've done. You don't want to end up in that place and say, well, but I'm saved. Here I am, Christ. Thank you for saving me. Which, I mean, yeah, you're going to say that. But then he's going to try your works and they're all going to be burned up. And that's what you get for eternity. Hey, I mean, look, amen, praise the Lord. Being in heaven is way better than being in hell. No one will argue with that. But it's funny, we were talking about this last week. Do you want to be called Mr. Least in heaven? Like, do you want to have just the least? I mean, do you want to be just, just I just squeaked by. I didn't, do, I didn't do a single thing for God. And it'll be evident. I mean, whatever, whatever all the rewards are that we receive, I think it'll be evident who has done a lot for God and who hasn't. And I don't want to be the person who's just, you know, you, you got a little tiny speck of like a piece of sand for the reward that actually made it through the fire. Like, oh, look, I got this. I want to have, have good rewards. 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. The amount of work that you put in individually, every single one of us, individually, the work that you do, you're going to receive a reward for. And that's, that's something to look forward to. He says in verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. And he's, he's using this illustration of, of a building. You know, every building that you build, especially a great building, has to start with a good foundation. If you don't have a good foundation, everything you build on is just going to crumble and fall anyways. It's not going to be able to stand. We need a good foundation. Well, he's relating this building to our lives, to our spiritual life. We have a foundation of Jesus Christ laid. He is our salvation. That's where it starts. That's where our life starts. That's where anything that we can do for God has to start with us being saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. Well, now, after you're saved, you want to build on that foundation. 
What are we going to build? What are we going to build for God? What kind of work are we going to do for God? And he says, now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So he gives all these different things that we could use to build on this foundation. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So it explains there, obviously, like if you have no good works, if all you have is the wood, the hay, the stubble, those are all things that burn up in the fire. Those things get, get devoured pretty quickly when you put them in the fire. But the, the gold, the silver, those precious stones, they make it through that heat. They don't, they don't decompose. They're not, they're not going to go away. They'll still abide through that fire. They're not going to burn up and be consumed. So even if all you had was the precious or the, the wood, the hay, and the stubble, you know, he says, well, you're going to suffer loss because all that work you did is just going to be gone. Everything you spent your time doing, all the valuable time you had on this earth, it all amounted to wood, hay, and stubble. It doesn't have to be sin, but it didn't amount to anything of eternal value. And that's just gone. He says, well, yeah, he himself shall be saved. You're going to suffer loss because basically everything you did was worthless. Literally worthless. I don't want the things that I do to be worthless in eternity. You could say, no, but it's got to, you know, don't get distracted with the value it may have temporarily in this lifetime, like having the riches. And say, well, I could get all these nice things and it makes my life here so much more comfortable. And that's what you spend all your time doing. And that ends up being wood, hay, and stubble. And then for all of eternity, instead of those couple of decades or however long you had on this earth to, to get that, that little bit extra of comfort, all the eternity, well, I don't really have anything that abided the fire because I spent all of my time focused on those 20 years or 30 years I had on earth. That's foolishness. We ought to be wise. Have the faith. You need the faith. You need to understand that these things are real. You know, <laughs> in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, this is talking about the judgment seat of Christ, which is really going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. This will happen one day. You'll be standing before Jesus Christ and all of your works are going to be tried. Keep that in mind. You know, we're going to forget about it. If you're not doing any good works for God, you're going to forget about this day. You're going to forget that there even is a judgment seat of Christ. Or you're going to get caught up with the things of this world. Be a doer of the work. Make sure you keep these things in remembrance. Say, hey, you know what? I'm working and I'm building on something here that's going to last. I know that one day at the judgment seat of Christ, these things that I'm working on, this is gold. This is silver. These are precious stones. These things that I'm doing, these are definitely going to abide the fire. And if you're wondering what that is, I, without a doubt, winning souls to Christ is on that list of things that you can do that, that will abide the fire. Anything that God has told us are good works for us to do, and we, we saw a bunch of them in these lists of, of different things we do, maintaining those good works from the Bible are going to make sure that... that we have that gold and silver and precious stones in the judgment seat of Christ. It's important that we do this. This has to be preached. He says, I will that thou affirm constantly. It's not just from behind the pulpit, but constantly within the church, provoking one another into good works. Very important. We don't want our faith to die. We want to have a lively faith. We want to continue to do things to serve God and that we can be looked upon even by men where, where God can receive glory by the works that we're doing and that nobody will have anything evil to say against us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you please uh, just help us to not get distracted with the deceitfulness of this world and of Satan, dear God, and of all the things that he, he's going to try to do to distract us from maintaining our good works for you. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to stay focused on the prize. Help us to stay focused on the eternal rewards, dear Lord, not the temporary rewards. The temporary rewards, I mean, if we go through difficult times and struggles and hunger and, 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 and lack of and having want of, of physical things, Lord, in the short term of our life, that is nothing compared to what we will receive 
if, if we give up the luxuries in this life in order to serve you to accumulate great riches and great wealth. Lord, help us to, to have this mindset, not to be so foolish to, to want to have everything right now, but to have patience. God, help us all to have that spirit of patience to be able to, to know to, that, that the work that we put in now will reap a reward much later, dear God. And we love you and we thank you for the exhortation that we have within our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.